So, <clears throat> it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce uh, Dr. Simon Musgrave. Now, I've known Simon for nearly half a century. Um, Simon and I were at the same secondary school. He was about a year in front of me. He, after leaving school, he um, became a very successful um, musician, playing the violin in multiple performances. Um, I certainly remember, Simon, that you were involved in the opera, because I remember one day um, <clears throat> I also had turned up to the opera um, to, to play um, a minor part in it and met up with an old school teacher who said, oh, Simon Musgrave's playing in this. And then in the early 1990s, um, Simon uh, led the way into studying linguistics, um, working on languages of Indonesia. Um, and I also followed him into that profession a year or so later. Uh, Simon has made a really um, important contributions in our field, um, both in terms of studying languages of Indonesia, but also his work on data management, which we're going to hear about shortly. And I was very fortunate to be a co-author of one of Simon's many publications on this topic. And, but you've also done a lot of research on medical discourse and probably um, many other things too. And Simon uh, retired from the um, linguistics program department, whatever it is, at Monash University last year. And since I've been about a year or two behind Simon throughout the entirety of my career, and you'll notice that we both have the same um, uh, kind of initials in our names, um, that is perhaps a message uh, that, uh, that I should follow him to the next stage. You're also about 10 days ahead of me in getting the COVID-19 jab. So Simon is one of those people that I've known about for close to half a century, who is always just a step or two ahead of me. And um, he's someone that's well known and well liked in the entire linguistic um, community. And I wish we could be doing this uh, introduction in person, but circumstances do not allow. So I will pass that over to you, Simon. You can mention some of your other achievements that I haven't mentioned here, um, if you wish. And yeah, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Stephen, for, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I don't think there's anything I need to add to that beyond hoping that um, if I've headed in the right direction, that it will you will want to follow me. But we'll see how that works out. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Um, I'll start by um, saying that certainly I am on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people today, and I would like to acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land, including acknowledging their elders past, present and future. Um, other people may be on other land and may want to substitute other names into this as they think about the acknowledgement we want to make here. Uh, as Stephen said in his introduction, one area that I've worked on during my career has been data management. And that's kind of what I'm talking about today, but not directly the, the management aspect. I'm talking more about the data. What kind of data there is for language use in Australia and where we might be looking for data if we want to have as comprehensive a view as possible of what has happened linguistically on this continent over its history. Um, I'm gonna be, this all is within the context of a project that I've been working in for the last couple of years, which is aiming to create a language data commons of Australia. This is an initiative that Michael Hoare began a couple of years back, and we've been working with various stakeholders, 
including the representatives of different universities, including institutions like the National Library and IATSIS, uh, the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, uh, and trying to generate some momentum to get the idea that some kind of digital infrastructure is going to be a crucial element of research based on language going into the future. This is not necessarily exclusively for the use of linguists, but it's you know, most of the people involved at this stage are linguists or closely associated. Um, what we're trying to do is make the language data that does exist in this country as accessible as possible, as much of it to be accessible as possible and trying to make sure that, that increases over time. We want the data to be as freely accessible as possible also. Of course, there have to be um, ethical considerations around some data. Some data is always going to be freely available. Other data will have to be restrictions. This has to be managed. We will be aiming to find the, the as good a balance as possible between these two considerations. And the aim really is to provide documentation of how language has been used in Australia, what kind of linguistic behaviour has occurred in Australia. The title of the project, Language Data Commons, suggests, or doesn't suggest it, it now makes explicit the model that we're adopting here, which is a commons model. And the idea of that is that control of this resource is something that the stakeholders, the contributors, the users should have. It shouldn't be run by bureaucrats it, because apart from anything else, they don't necessarily understand what's needed. But um, it's important that this remains under the control of the people who contribute and who use the data. So we're using a commons model. This is increasingly um, the approach that's been taken with large sources of data in open science and similar movements. So it's in line with a general, uh, a general trend across the world. We want the data to be used as widely as possible. We want to make it as available to as many people as possible, and there shouldn't be any expectations about what kind of use they're going to make of it except possibly for commercial reasons, but people with all sorts of different interests should be able to come to this material and use it and enjoy it even. So we imagine that researchers certainly will be interested, but also school students can use this kind of resource. And anybody who has an interest in how language is being used should be able to access this material and investigate stuff for themselves. I say researchers, and when we're thinking of researchers, we're thinking in terms of a multidisciplinary resource. So, of course, linguists rely on language data for their work, but there are other kinds of research which are based on language data. So historians, social scientists, literary scholars, a variety of people can be interested, political scientists can be interested in the kind of material that we will be presenting, making available, and we hope that it will be used by people across a wide range of disciplines. Now, at the end of uh, last year, the Department of Education announced that they were committing almost $9 million to building research infrastructure in the humanities and social sciences area. The money is being funneled through ARDC, which is the Australian Research Data Commons organisation. And the work of the Language Data Commons of Australia is being funded for the next couple of years, at least, through this stream of money. Um, it's one of four areas that were identified by the government when they made the announcement. The others are Indigenous data network, um, a social science, area and another one which escapes me. Anyway, language data commons or as the government called it, linguistic data commons is part of this funding. 
and it guarantees that at least for the next couple of years, this project should have a really good basis. So what are we planning to actually include when we talk about language data in Australia? Where do we start? First of all, of course, we know a lot about some data sources. We've been working in this area, some of us, for a number of years. So Michael and I were both involved in creating the Australian National Corpus over 10 years ago now. We have catalogued, we have surveyed, we have audited, we know quite a lot about what's out there. And at least in the short term, our questions are really more about not what is the what data is there, it's more about what data should have highest priorities. What things do we need to worry about first? And then we're asking ourselves questions like, what will be immediately useful? Um, as we are all aware, the way these things work, if government is putting money into a project like this, they want to see that it's being used. They want results. So that's an important question. What kind of data are people really wanting to use that we can make accessible quickly? But there are also issues about um, the security of data. And it's actually something that the government has flagged in their announcements, that they're concerned about data that may be precarious, data that needs to be uh, stored more securely. So that's also a consideration that we are aware of sources of data which do need attention and we'll be looking at those. And we're also interested in what kind of relationships we can leverage to make data available. And a good example of how this might work is uh, the National Library of Australia. They have fantastic resources, some of them are already very accessible via Trove, other things not so accessible. For example, the National Library took um, responsibility for the Internet Archive of Australia recently, and that's a colossal amount of text, which potentially is very interesting to researchers, currently very hard to work with. So that's the kind of area where we hope we can work on existing relationships and make stuff work better. So that's in the short term. Um, we have to set priorities. We have clear ideas about what they might be. But over the long term, I think it's important that we also take a more conceptual view and start asking the question of what are the possibilities out there? What kinds of possibilities were there to make records of language use? And what have been the results of those possibilities? Not everything was possible. There are gaps and we can identify some of those gaps, I think, by looking at these questions in, I've said, conceptual or more abstract way, although they have practical consequences, of course. So that's what I'm going to try to do today is a first pass over this kind of landscape. Over the history of Australia, what possibilities existed to make records of language that was being used and to what extent were those possibilities actually taken up? So there are two key questions that I'm going to be focusing on here. The first one is what languages were being used at any given time? And, you know, there are that's a big question. There are lots of different languages that have been and are being used on this continent. And it's changed over time. So that affects the possibilities, obviously, of what records might exist. And thinking about that, of course, implies another question, which is who was here? Speakers of which languages were here? So that's one question to look at. And the other question that I want to focus on is about technology. What were the technological means that were available in order to record language and use at different times? And I'm going to structure what I present around what I see as three major points of articulation in the technological history. 
The first one is when written records start being made. The second one is when records in terms of media, audio and visual media start being made. And the third one is, of course, the digital revolution, which we all have lived through and which we just can't ignore in this context. So those are the two strands I'm going to try to pull together in what I'm talking about here. What languages were being used? What possibilities were there to make records? So let's start at the beginning. Before European contact, we know that there was a very rich linguistic ecology. Estimates typically say 250 plus individual languages, but we also know that within that landscape of many languages, there was a lot of multilingualism and multidialectalism. So very uh, diverse linguistic behaviour. There was a limited amount of external contact as well in that period. Nick Evans has done important work showing the kind of contact that might have happened between uh, Macassaries, essentially, people and other, to the lesser extent, other people probably from Indonesia and people in Northern Australia. And there were loan words that, that uh, reflect that contact. So there was, it was a continent internal linguistic ecology with some contact outside as well. But there was no means to preserve any of what was going on. Oral transmission was the only way that people were passing on knowledge and stories and so forth. And we don't have those records. So a major change in the story then occurs at European contact. Europeans came. So, of course, um, Makassar, for example, had a written tradition. There was a writing system associated with Makassar, but there's no, as far as I know, no evidence that anybody from Makassar wrote down records of what they encountered in Australia. So it's European contact that brings writing as a technological means of recording language to the Australian content. And written records become possible. Now, I'm not going to claim to be an expert in this area, but my, as far as I do have knowledge, the contact that occurred before Captain Cook in 1770, the written records based on that are negligible. So there were Portuguese and Dutch navigators who came to the coast of Australia, who made some contact probably with Indigenous people, but did not produce much in the way of records. It's really with Cook's party that we start to get some kind of documentation. Cook himself recorded things, Joseph Banks recorded stuff, other members of their party did as well. Um, it's not clear at all how reliable any of those kind of records are. Uh, if you are interested reading the dispute about what kangaroo might actually have meant to the people that Cook originally heard using it, these are complicated questions which we don't have good answers to. But at least they started writing stuff down. And the languages of Australia then continued to be recorded in this way by different kinds of people throughout the 19th century. Uh, again, I'm not an expert in this area and I'm very conscious that we do have a real expert on this topic in the room. So I'm not gonna to say too much about it, but just to say that you know, different kinds of people like explorers, um, administrators like George Augustus Robinson, they made records of the languages spoken by the Indigenous people with whom they came into contact, often and mainly just word lists, but they did record something. And in fact, pretty much anybody could be bothered did it. 
the kinds of people who did it were not trained, they were not experts in language generally, but they did make records. But this was completely unsystematic and very limited. So in 1945, Sidney Baker writing about the Australian language said what you can see on the screen, the records of their languages are extremely deficient. There was no exhaustive grammar of an Aboriginal language at that point, and there wasn't even a dictionary, a comprehensive dictionary. So we have records, but they are unsystematic and intermittent. And they are scattered. Where they are actually stored is you know, by chance. Where did people's papers end up? And even today, people are discovering new sources. Um, again, Stephen knows far more about this than me, but I have had um, conversations with Michael Walsh in recent years about work he's done in the State Library of New South Wales. And he's been finding bunches of papers containing information about indigenous languages, which nobody knew about until he found them. So there probably is still material to be uncovered. We don't know how much. We don't know what it'll be, but there will be little bits and pieces that keep popping up, I suspect. So that's what's happened through the period of the first technological um, range of possibilities, the written record for Australian languages. Of course, the people who brought that technology with them also brought their own language. So English has had its presence in Australia since 1788. Okay, they were there. Cook was there in 1770, but nobody hung around. But since 1788, there have been people speaking English living on this continent. Again, what we have until at least the end of the 19th century is written records, but these are much more extensive, right? Much, much more detailed than anything we have for indigenous languages. Clemens Fritz uh, created the corpus of Oz Early English for his PhD project back in the noughties. And that's a good sampling of the available materials. He covers four different areas, government documents, personal material, speech-based material, um, 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 fiction, right? published writing. And it's a, it's a decent sample, of course, we have the problem that we encounter with data based on written sources, which is a heavy bias towards non-vernacular styles. Fritz looked at personal correspondence and some of that is um, less formal, less standard, but even quite a lot that of course is fairly standard. There is, I'm sure, quantities of that kind of less formal material that still exists to be made accessible. And that would, of course, be valuable. Personal letters, diaries, places where people didn't automatically revert to a very formal, very standard way of using the language. It would be great to know more about how that worked in 19th century Australia. So there's a project if anybody wants to take it on. OK, so we have, not surprisingly, pretty good written records of English in Australia in the 19th century. Were there other non-Indigenous languages? Well, yes, of course there were. And it turns out that there was a surprising level of documentation for some of them. One important language, at least for the first part of the 19th century, is Irish. A large 
up to a third of the convicts who came to Australia were of Irish origin, and quite a number of them spoke Irish. I'll return to that in a moment because there's some interesting questions around that. There were occasionally speakers of other languages in Australia in the first part of the 19th century. Um, ships came in and so forth. People landed up in Australia and stayed. But the big influx of speakers of other languages comes in the middle of the 19th century after the discovery of gold, when huge numbers of people came from around the world to try to make their fortune. And speakers of many different languages were included. Um, it's, always, it's always salutary to remember that one of the crew key figures in an iconic event in Australian life, the Eureka Rebellion, was Italian. You know, the, the gold fields were a mixing pot for many different nationalities and languages. So the speakers of major European languages certainly were present and speakers of Sinitic languages. I'm avoiding saying Chinese here because I'm sure that you know, we're talking more about people speaking Cantonese or Min dialects, but we're not talking about people speaking what we've now called Pudong Lai. Right? Um, the people who might be observing them certainly weren't making those distinctions. But what was actually being used would be really interesting to know about. To the extent that there are written records, obviously we get to more standard varieties. So I'm gonna come back and talk about what kind of written records there are in a moment. Um, but first, I want to talk, come back to Gaelic or Irish. And what's striking here is that there's really not much in terms of a written record. It was the most common European language in early Australia, beyond, after English, right? As I said, up to a third of the convicts who came to Australia were of Irish origin. And it's claimed by some people, Noon in particular, that a high proportion of Irish immigrants could speak Irish. So we would expect possibly that there would be more of a record and also more of an influence on English in Australia. Um, Kate Burridge and I have done some work in this area. And what's I think really striking is how little influence this seems to have had on how English developed in Australia. Why is that the case? Well, one reason is that um, the Irish were seen as potentially traitors, potentially um, threatening to the English dominance, the English power in Australia. Some Irish convicts were actually political prisoners. Not many, but some were, and they were taken as representative of the whole group. And speaking Irish was actually seen as something to be suspected, that it was being used as a secret language to plan insurrections and disobedience. So it was seen as potentially a subversive influence. And that's, I think, one reason why it had less influence than we might expect. There are also reasons to think that although many of the Irish people who came here could speak Irish, there's reasons to think that they didn't use it very much. That many of them, particularly after, um, particularly when free settlers were coming rather than convicts, many of them were more what we might think of as more modern, more forward thinking people, and they saw English as the language of advancement. So there are reasons for uh, Irish not having as much influence as we might expect and not being recorded as much as we might expect. The extent to which it's retained, there's kind of contrary evidence here. 
Um, there are, for example, is the evidence that when Catholic Church started to recruit priests to come to Australia, fairly quickly it became obvious that they needed some Gaelic speaking priests, otherwise confessions were not going to be heard. So there's evidence that people were continuing to use uh, Irish, at least for some purposes. And there are records of interpreters being used for court cases on occasions. Not many, but they, they, there are records. But against that, areas where you might expect to see the language, it just isn't there. And I think there's a really striking example, which Patrick O'Farrell pointed out in his book on the Irish in Australia, that there are really no tombstones of Irish people in Australia which used Irish. And that was a place where it really couldn't be considered to be a subversive act. And it couldn't be considered to be bringing opprobrium on people. It could have been a celebration of identity, but it didn't happen. And I think this is quite striking evidence as to the status of Irish in early Australian, in early Australia. And suggests again that it, there are reasons why there's such a limited record. It's perhaps worth seeing that the Gaelic revival, which occurred you know, in Ireland in the later 19th century into the early 20th century, had some impact in Australia. There was a bilingual magazine that represented that movement, which was published in Melbourne in the 1920s. So there was some kind of attempt to revive Irish influence, Irish language, but very limited. So that's a little bit of a story about Gaelic. What about other languages, other European languages, other languages other than English in Australia in the 19th century? And what I'm going to base my discussion here on is data from Trove and data harvested by a, a really wonderful, wonderful scholar called Tim Sherratt. Tim used to work at the National Library. He was one of the people who helped build Trove. Since he has been working outside the library, he's done fabulous work in showing people how to exploit the resources that are available at the National Library. And one of the things that he has done is to produce a list of newspapers in the Trove collection that are in languages other than English. And that's what I'm going to base my discussion on here. As a, a slight digression, I'll point out that um, if you go to the link that's on the screen, uh, I'll put that in chat later or something, make sure everybody can get it if they need it. Um, it lists these papers and Tim's run some kind of language recognition software over the data that he scraped. And there's some quite um, amusing results there. There's like material which is, says it's this data is 99% German, 1% Maltese. And you kind of scratch your head and wonder how did it come up with those results? That's completely an aside. Um, okay, and so this is written sources we're discussing here. These are newspapers published in languages other than English in Australia in the 19th century. So what are we looking at? First of all, German. Now, as many of you probably are aware, there was a substantial German settlement in South Australia. And um, that's reflected in the written record. We owe at least one source on Australian languages to that German presence. So Ghana language was documented by German missionaries in the 19th century. One of the most systematic and detailed descriptions of an indigenous language that we have before the 20th century. So Adelaide, not surprisingly, was the center for activity in German language. And there were publications appearing in Adelaide for 60 years, even into World War I. 
publication continued. So this is ongoing activity. There was also publications out of Sydney, but a little bit later and didn't go on for nearly as long. So German, at least in South Australia, was a very present part of the linguistic landscape. It's probably also worth noting here that unusually for uh, some of these languages, we have some of kind of audio record due to the work of Michael Klein with uh, German speaking Australians from the 1960s. And that data is secured in Germany. So German, there's quite a lot of written material. Chinese, as I mentioned earlier, what people were actually speaking as Chinese languages in Australia in the 19th century, we can't really know. The writing systems are more or less common across various varieties. So that's what would have been published. And there were publications. So from the Victorian goldfields in the 1850s already, we have Chinese language material being published. And then materials published in both the major East Coast cities through the rest of the time up to World War II at least. So Sydney had various publications, three of them over different somewhat overlapping periods and Melbourne had one over a shorter period. So there was definitely a presence of written Chinese records through the 19th century into the 20th century. French, surprisingly to me, or somewhat surprisingly, has a presence. Not a huge presence, but there was something from relatively early compared to some other languages, and it lasted for a while. So starting in the 1870s, there was some publication and went through in Sydney, there was a publication that endured for over a century. Italian, we tend to think of as something that was part of post-war, post-World War II migration to Australia. But as I already mentioned, you know, Raffaele Carbone was part of the Eureka Rebellion. Italians were certainly in Australia earlier than that. And there's a surprising amount of written activity. Most of it in Sydney. A range of publications over more than 50 years. And at one point, there were three publications coexisting in Sydney. So there was really quite a lot of activity. Surprisingly to me, again, looking at this material, there was a publication briefly in Perth. And after World War II, of course, there's a lot. Um, there was something going on in Sydney for the 10 years from late in the Second World War, but then we see a shift to uh, full regular newspapers published on a weekly basis. So in Sydney, there was La Fiamma, and in Melbourne, there was Il Globo. At one point, at some point, they actually become essentially the same thing, but they retained um, their separate mastheads. What's accessible in terms of uh, archives from those publications is an interesting question that deserves, we will certainly be following up on. Greek, similar situation, we think of it as um, something that comes to Australia after World War II, but there was a little bit of activity earlier in Sydney. But then similar to Italian, we see the development of a newspaper. Between 1949 and 1957, it was published under one title. And then after 1957, it became Nous Cosmos, which is uh, well known and is still published today. Again, the extent to which there's an archive is a question to be followed up. So, there's a whole range of languages which have quite significant written records through the 19th century up to World War II. After World War II, we see you know, Greek and Italian. I've showed you what kind of material there was. And there's also material for lots of other European languages. Um, many of these were 
very small communities or relatively small communities and the publications were commensurately not extensive but they existed and they even continue to exist so i was chatting to john hadjek the other day about this and he said that his mother still subscribes to a slovenian newsletter which is published every fortnight i think he said by um through a catholic church in melbourne so these kinds of materials do exist the ones that are in trove obviously are much more accessible and um, a great place to start looking at what kind of data we can collect from them. So that's um, a quick survey of written material for languages other than English in Australia in this period before we get to recordings in other media. It's also worth thinking about what happened in terms of contact languages in this period. So we're thinking of trying to think about who was here and what languages they were using. And contact languages are part of the picture. There's evidence, accounts of pigeons being used in early contact between the settlers in at Botany Bay or Port Jackson and the local indigenous people. Although there are, the, the accounts are fairly minimal, but we know that this kind of contact language was being used. And over time, we know that two more enduring varieties have come into existence. So there's Aboriginal English, which is really a variety, range of varieties, uh, but which is definitely something that exists. And although it's probably been around for much longer, we have good records of it from around 1980. And the other enduring contact varieties, Creole, which originated at the Roper River Mission in the Northern Territory and has spread across a substantial part of Northern Australia now. And again, we have decent material for that since the 1980s. I'm going to come back to the nature of or the what there exists in those um, contact varieties and why in a moment. I just want to mention two other two other contact varieties that have occurred as a result of the presence of uh, other groups speaking other languages in Australia. First of all, Queensland Kanaka English, which was a result of contact between the English speaking population and the 60,000 odd Melanesians who came to work in the cane fields in Queensland from 1860 on. A pigeon or a range of pigeons developed during the period when these people were working in Australia, but we have basically no records. We know it was there. Um, Tom Dutton, as you can see on the screen, interviewed one of the last surviving speakers in 1964, but that's a fairly limited source. There are people who will tell you that this was essentially the same as, or closely related to variety uh, creoles such as Tokpisan and Bislama, but we really don't know. That may be true, but we're not sure. Another contact language which existed during the period we're looking at here was a pigeon in broom. This was the result of pearl divers coming from Asia, the start of the 20th century. Uh, they were not all necessarily from one place, but they used Malay as a lingua franca and a pigeon based on contact between English and Malay came into existence. Potentially, this was um, really fascinating because local Indigenous people also were involved in the contact situations where this was used. And we have, but we know nothing about the nature of this really. So we don't know what kind of impact that might have had. So here we have 
a couple of contact languages about which we have really no records. And in terms of the contact languages which develop between Indigenous people and um, speakers of English, we know very little. Why is that? Well, of course, when we're looking at how records of language use are created, there's always a social context. There are important social factors which affect what happens. And the crucial factor here is who's in control of the technology? Who is using the technology and how are they choosing to use it? And how they choose to use it depends on what they value. So when we uh, think about the quest these two questions, who controls the technology, what do they value, then I think this tells us a lot or helps us understand the absences in data in terms of these contact languages. The people who might have made records of them did not have see any value in them. And therefore, at least until around 1980, when people started to think that the contact varieties that were being used by Indigenous people were interesting and might have value. And then we start to see records, whereas before we don't. And of course, these questions are relevant to all the data I've been talking about. Who saw this as important? And why, so why did we end up actually with records that do exist? Okay, I've, I've just checked the time and found that I'm much further into the, the allotted time than I expected. So I'm going to have to try and move a little bit more quickly. I apologize for this. Okay, so that's my survey of the period where written records were what we had, what were possible. And I've tried to give you an idea of what actually resulted from that possibility. We start to get possibility of recording sound and vision in the late 19th century. And this is the second point where there's a technological articulation. The crucial thing, at least initially for linguists, is you can document the sounds of speech. And that's, of course, hugely important. And when you get vision, then you can also see gesture and sign language is something that can be recorded also. So as I said, these techniques, technologies start to develop in the latter part of the 19th century. The first sound recording that the National Film and Sound Archive has in its catalogue is in, made in Australia is in 1888, but that was music. The first recording in their catalogue, which I can identify as speech, it's called a comic monologue, and that's around 1896. So this is the point at which these technologies start to be available. Were they used to record indigenous languages? Well, not very much. There is the earliest catalog entry of this kind for the Film and Sound Archive is in 1899, a recording of a woman who claimed to be the last of the Tasmanian Aborigines. And at IATSIS, the earliest catalog entry they have is 1898. So there was a, an anthropological expedition to the Torres Strait uh, from Cambridge University, and they made quite a lot of recordings. And they are by and large in IATSIS now. From that point on, so from around the start of the 20th century, there is some kind of audio record for Australian languages. Again, it's, much of it is unsystematic, but material does exist. And a lot of it is curated by IATSIS and is reasonably secure. But there's, um, there is stuff elsewhere. Um, and as with written records, it's possible that new material will occasionally turn up. What about recordings of English? Well, of course, there's a lot of stuff recorded in English from the start of the 20th century. But as far as I know, the first time people 
seriously tried to record Australian English with the intention of documenting it is the work of Mitchell and Delbridge. And their school recordings, which were made at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, are the first big set of materials that I know of that still exist. And they're digitally available from the University of Sydney Library. It's quite hard to track them down, but they are there. Of course, as I said, there's lots of recordings of Australians speaking from earlier, but they were not made with the intention of examining the use of language. And they're scattered. They're all over the place. We have to look for them. So the questions that are relevant here is who would be interested in making those recordings and also preserving them? One answer to this question is the archives of the ABC, which contains audio recordings from 1932 on and television material from 1956. Obviously, this is a valuable resource, but it's not that easy to work with. Their access and use conditions are complex, and to a large extent, they treat this material as a commercial resource. A lot of things they want you to pay for. But there is a lot of material there, and this is one kind of area where I talked about <clears throat> leveraging relationships. Um, I think this is one that the Data Commons project will want to pursue, to at least be talking to the ABC about what kinds of possibilities there might be for accessing data. Another answer to this quest these questions about who would record and who would preserve is oral historians. And I'm gonna come back to talk to them a little bit later. Other languages, there is material recorded, audio recordings. Um, it's again, it's um, unsystematic and it's hard to track stuff down. A lot of it will be in private hands. Accessing it through community associations is a possibility at least. Another possibility that is interesting to follow here is SBS Radio, which has existed now for uh, almost 50 years and currently has broadcast in 68 languages. Now, the question then is, do they have an archive? <laughs> uh, nothing on their web presence makes this clear. I do have a contact there and I've been trying to get information, but I haven't got any answers yet. My suspicion is that there's some kind of storage of material, but how much and in what languages and over what period of time is um, still something we're trying to track down. What about um, visual recordings? The technology is a little less recent. It's a bit hard to track down the earliest, um, earliest examples here because obviously for language, we're not interested in silent movies, but the National Film and Sound Archive doesn't specify the difference between silent movies and sound recorded and movies with sound in its catalogue. So I really haven't been able to track there what the earliest examples are. But I access the earliest example which might count as a video recording with sound is from 1933, when Tyndale made recordings of Ernabella with a silent film and accompanying wax cylinder audio. The first unequivocal sound movie listed by IATSIS is from 1948. So this is much more as a shorter time span than audio. Video recordings of English are, of course, in Australia are not hard to find. The Film and Sound Archive, big collection. Again, the ABC archives are a source. And particularly interesting because they have interviews, non-scripted material. Because filming with sound was expensive before digital equipment was available, there's not really much in the way that's equivalent to oral history material where, you know, cassette recorders and so forth were available to people. So the video record is less 
probably less varied than the audio record. So, as I've just mentioned, recording equipment until around 1980 at least was expensive and hard to transport. And that affected what people could do. This was a problem for audio, even a worse problem for film. So film equipment was really expensive and hard to transport, sound recording. In the decade before things went digital, there was some improvement in the situation. Some of us still remember affectionately the Walkman professional recorder. But and there's, there's some increase in the amount of material that was recorded around then. But really, these were problems that persisted until we got into a fully digital mode. So there was less material than potentially there could have been. And there were further disadvantages. The media that result from these recording processes are delicate. They have to be stored carefully. And just using the recordings degrades them because you know, there's physical contact between a reading head and a tape or the film is running through a projector. Every time you actually use it, you are inflicting some kind of damage on it. So these were problems with these technologies, which to our delight and joy, you know, were solved by digital revolution. And the kind of things that have happened over the last few decades in terms of these technologies transform how we look at language data. Obviously, this is true for multimodal data. The equipment with which you can make recordings, video, audio, it's cheap, it's portable, and it produces excellent results. And the kind of problems I just alluded to in terms of storing the data have vanished. You can replicate your data, you can edit it, you can disseminate it, and you don't affect it at all. You keep copies of stuff all over the place, they're all identical. And the storage problems are general storage problems. Lots of people have lots of different kinds of data. The way we store it, it's all basically the same. And there's a general problem that everybody has to deal with, there are not specific problems relating to recording media. So all of this stuff makes life much, much easier in terms of multimodal data, multimodal data, but of course it also affects how we view written data. We've got optical character recognition, which gives us access to huge amounts of machine readable text. So you know, what Google has done in terms of uh, digitizing material, what other people have done, it's provides massive amounts of data. And nowadays, that's also starting to apply to um, handwritten material. We see new genres of material have come into existence. And those are generating colossal amounts of data again. And we have tools which allow us to work with those colossal amounts of data, which we just couldn't have done with traditional methods. So these things have impacts on data collection practices, but we face new problems. First of all, there's so much data that we potentially could collect, we have to think about what data we are going to collect. Finding the data is not a problem, but choosing which part of it or how much of it we want to actually record, that may be not so straightforward. This is not a question that people really had to face before, before it was grab anything you could. Now we can be choosy and we need to think about how we make those decisions. And we also face problems sometimes in relation to who controls the data. One thing that is becoming an issue or question of concern possibly is what does public domain mean anymore? If you publish stuff on Facebook, anybody or Twitter and anybody can view it, does that mean it's public domain? Does that mean there's copyright doesn't apply anymore? These questions are still being decided. 
and they affect data collection practices. And of course, many of the large collections of data are regarded as commercial assets. People are assembling them for their commercial purposes. And that can affect what people, what people who want to collect language data can do. Although there are possibilities where um, the difference in aims between the people who want to commercially exploit data and what uh, people interested in language might want to do, you can negotiate solutions. And a nice example of this is the fact that um, people have figured out that you can get around possible copyright protection issues in large corpora by using, by shuffling the sentences. And if you're only interested in things like word frequencies, it doesn't matter whether the sentences are in the original order when you actually do your analysis. So there are possibilities that you can, that may open up in terms of using some of these data sources. There are also problems that come up about the nature of locality in this digital world. If we're interested in Australian language use in Australia or the use of Australian language, what does that mean in a digital world? If you're comparing, if you have, for example, material online written by someone who grew up in Australia but now lives in Europe, and you also have material from someone who grew up in Europe and now lives in Australia, which one do you regard as really Australian or more Australian or equally Australian? So these kinds of issues, I think, are new and potentially difficult. I'm going to wrap up fairly quickly, I hope, from here. I've gone on way too long. Um, just looking at a couple of examples of how the digital revolution has changed what we do and suggesting that they this gives us some ideas about how we might work in the future. So one area where digital revolution has had a huge impact is in sign language research. Auslan has came into existence somewhere after 1860. It was around from then on, but there were minimal records of it. Firstly, making written records of it were difficult. Secondly, the kind of social factors that I mentioned earlier applied. People didn't value it. And it wasn't until 1989 when Trevor Johnson produced his dictionary that there was a genuine written record of Auslan. But already in 1989, things had started moving and the printed dictionary almost immediately was supplanted by an online multimedia version, Sign Bank. Indigenous sign languages have been recognized as existing from early in the 20th century. Again, we have virtually no records until recently where there's been you know, valuable work done. All the current work in this area relies on digital video. So sign language research is now much more vital, much more possible than it was for most of the 20th century. It's had a, the digital impact on this area of research has been really huge and beneficial. The other area I want to mention briefly is oral history. So again, this is a field which has expanded hugely since digital methods were available. You know, people did make oral history recordings on reel-to-reel -reel recorders and cassette tapes, but now that you can do it on a phone or a small device and get really good quality, easily editable material, it's expanded massively. And this is activity that's organized at various levels. So you get funded research projects, you get local historical societies, you get private endeavors, people recording their grandparents. There's a lot of material out there and it's linguistically interested. It's, sorry, linguistically interesting. It documents how language has been used at different times. And you, even if you're only looking at an apparent time effect, you're still seeing, you know, some possible, you can still examine changes in some ways. So this is potentially really important data. Uh, and it's an area where which we're keen to try and 
get into, to try and find access to a lot of this material. And I think this is a good place to end this presentation because I think it shows us the benefits of this broader way of thinking about language data, not just thinking about what there is, but about what there might be, what the possibilities are. So oral history data, we're thinking about material which was not collected by linguists and was not necessarily with any linguistic interest in mind when it was collected. It's been recorded by other people for some purpose of theirs, but we could use it. It has value as part of the record of language use. And there are mutually beneficial relationships which can be developed around this kind of interaction. So it's of value to many people to have this kind of data made accessible. And it's of value to the oral history community to have their data made more widely available also. And at least in some cases, bringing this data into a language commons has the benefit of me giving it stable storage. So you know, local historical societies or individual private collectors can't guarantee that their material will persist. Bringing it on board in a data commons, that can happen. We can know that at least for some horizon, we'll have material available and stored in a persistent fashion. So thinking about new ways, uh, new sources of data, so existing sources of data which can be imported into this kind of system is a way of enriching the whole process and involving more and more people and making more and more data available for more and more useful purposes. I've spoken for way too long, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, I certainly found it really um, very interesting to see such a, a comprehensive overview. Unfortunately, some of some of our audience have had to leave because the sort of one hour um, way in which we operate. But I think we do have a little time for discussion. If someone, there were a few things that came up in the chat, many of which you have dealt with. Um, uh, but I would, does someone have a question or a, a point they would like to raise for discussion? It's, I just said, that, was, that was just a wonderful talk. I, I enjoyed that so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking when you were starting to talk about early recordings, I mean, one of the issues with those will be tracking down where they are because they could well be, as manuscripts might be, um, in different places in Europe um, and just not even known to people in Australia at present. Um, yes. So, although I imagine the number of locations where recordings are stored, um, sound recordings are stored in Europe are still relatively few, but yeah. Mm. Um, anyway, that was just something I thought of. Does anybody have a question or a point they'd like to raise? Brett, are you putting your hand up because you want to speak? I was just going to make a slightly pedantic point about oral history and oral oral traditions, Simon. Um, I think I heard you claim that we don't know anything about you know, oral tradition, but of course we do. It's still there. Um, and in fact, people are still speaking the language, which has been passed on orally, of course. So. The record is still there, it's just not in the way that you, I think you meant, which is we don't have a record of what people were actually saying at that time, which is a bit different. Yes. I, so I, yes, I glossed over that, that indeed the oral tradition continues and um, to the extent that it has been captured, it happened after European contact. And, 
but yes, we don't, we have no way of knowing what kind of changes might have occurred since the earlier period. Yes, thank you, you're, you're right. David Nash, are you, have you come on to picture because you wish to speak? Uh, well, I switched to another machine because uh, you froze up on me, Stephen, but I thought it was at my end. Right. Um, but given I now have the uh, screen, <laughs> um, and perhaps I missed it in changing over or something, Simon, but uh, what about the future of um, automatic transcription and, and so on, enhancing these collections that you've mentioned, and then the, uh, or the, um, what's it called, the, uh, some projects about in, um, enhanced, uh, what is it called, speed, speeded up transcription with a human machine collaboration. Yeah, that's, this is an exciting area. Um, even at the kind of basic level of providing an initial transcription using speech recognition technology, which you can then refine, it's, it has the potential to hugely accelerate our data processing practices. There's interesting work that's now being done that suggests that you know, the traditional view has been that if you wanted to get this to work in any useful way, you needed substantial amounts of training data. But the, there are people who are taking speech recognition, basically trained on English and applying it to other languages and getting decent kind of results, at least as an initial starting point. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's a fantastic possibility. And there's exciting work being done. And it will, um, it will change the way people work, yeah. Yes, well, and as uh, Brett's just mentioned, Stephen Bird's stuff, that includes a reference to this re-speaking. So the computers teach the uh, re-speaker how to speak properly so that they can be understood. Yes. I, I just put some comments in the um, chat because one of the things I'm interested in doing, it's not, not to do with Australia, but is documenting the manuscript traditions in the parts of Northeast India and Burma that I work and there what we want people to do is to re-speak them, um, read them in their traditional way and then re-speak them in a way that can be understood um, because the traditional reading styles are not so easy. So the re-speaking technology is probably a very useful one for at least some areas of linguistic analysis and documentation. Mm -hmm. um, but. I haven't quite got on top of how to do it. So anyway, yeah. Anything else that anyone would like to raise or discuss? Because um, if not, I think we'll again say thanks to Simon. Um, and um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for attending. I think we've had people from several countries here today, several continents, in fact. Um, so, and a really wonderful talk, which uh, I'll be um, stopping the recording in a moment and we will be putting it up on um, our YouTube channel. Um, so all of this um, excellent knowledge uh, will be um, preserved, documented. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks again, Simon, and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, we're expecting to have our next seminar in two weeks, but I'll get back to you all about that.